This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 28, The Null Space of a Matrix. Our objectives for this lecture are, given a matrix A and a vector, determine whether the vector is in the null space of A, given a matrix, find a spanning set for its null space, and reason about null spaces of abstract matrices. In lecture 27, we talked about subspaces of Rn, and given an m by n matrix A, in the next couple of lectures we're going to be talking about two important subspaces, one subspace of Rn and one subspace of Rm, that are associated with that matrix. In this lecture, we'll talk about the null space of A. So what's the null space of a matrix? So if we have an m by n matrix A, the null space, which we write null A, that's the set of all vectors x in Rn with the property that A times x equals 0. We can write this in set builder notation, and as you can see here, this is a property description because the vectors that are in the null space of A are the vectors that have the property that A times x equals 0. Let's take a look at an example. So if A is this matrix and U is the vector 1, negative 1, 2, is that vector in the null space of A? This question is equivalent to asking whether A times U equals 0. So all we have to do here is multiply A times U and see if we get the 0 vector. So we set up our matrix A times the vector U. Remember how we do this? We go across each row of the matrix and down the entries of the vector, multiplying and adding. So we see that the first entry of A times U is 0. So it's looking good so far. But now when we compute the second entry, we get negative 5. And since we multiplied A times U and we didn't get the 0 vector, that means that this vector U is not in the null space of A. Here's another example. So here we have a matrix A and a vector U that has a variable in it, and we want to know which values of that variable make that vector be in the null space of A. So remember, the vector being in the null space of A means that A times that vector equals the 0 vector. So we have to multiply A times the vector and see what we get. Again, going across the rows of our matrix and down the entries of our vector, we get the vector 12 plus 6h, negative 4 minus 2h, and 8 plus 4h. So for that to equal the 0 vector, all three of those entries would all have to equal 0 at the same time for the same value of h. So let's set each of those expressions equal to 0 and see what happens. The solution of each of those equations is h equals negative 2, so that means that h equals negative 2 is the only value of h for which this vector is in the null space of a. If we had gotten different values of h for those equations, then there would have been no value of h that would simultaneously make all of the entries of a times u equal 0, so there would have been no solution. But because we got the same value for each of the equations, that means that that value works to make a times u equal 0. And we can check that. We can multiply a times the vector negative 4 and negative 2 and verify that we do in fact get the 0 vector. Now another place that null spaces arise is when we talk about linear transformations. When we have a linear transformation from Rn to Rm with standard matrix A, the null space of A is the set of all vectors x in Rn that have the property that T of x equals 0. And in this context, the null space is called the kernel of T. Now I've been calling this set a null space, but we haven't actually established that this set is a subspace of Rn. So let's go ahead and prove that now. We talked about subspaces in the previous lecture, and we know that the definition of subspace is that this set has three properties. The null space has to contain the zero vector, it has to be closed under addition, and it has to be closed under scalar multiplication. So why does the null space contain the zero vector? Well remember, a vector being in the null space means that the matrix times that vector equals the zero vector. But any matrix times the zero vector is going to equal the zero vector, and so that shows us that the zero vector is in the null space. The second thing we have to prove is that if we have two vectors in our null space, then the sum of those two vectors is in our null space. So we'll start by writing let u and v be vectors in the null space of A. What does that tell us about these vectors? Well, it tells us that a times u equals the zero vector, and that a times v equals the zero vector, and that's from the definition of null space. So now we want to know what happens when we multiply a times u plus v. Well, we can distribute that multiplication, so a times u plus v is au plus av, au is 0, and av is 0, so that's the 0 vector plus the 0 vector, which is the 0 vector, and since a times u plus v was the 0 vector, that shows us that u plus v is in the null space. Finally, we have to prove that the null space is closed under scalar multiplication, so 
just like the proofs that we wrote back in lecture 27, we'll start by saying let u be a vector in the null space of A and let c be a scalar. And remember that u being in the null space of A means that A times u equals zero. And again, that's coming from the definition of null space. So now we wanna know what happens when we multiply A times cu. We want that to also be the zero vector. So A times cu is c times au, that's that compatibility property. And au is the zero vector, so c times the zero vector is the zero vector. And since a times cu was the zero vector, that shows that cu is in the null space of a. Now one drawback with the way that we've defined null space is that this is an implicit definition. It's defined by a property that has to be checked. There's no obvious way to generate elements of the null space of a just from that definition. So what we'd like to have is what's called a spanning set for the null space of a. That's a collection of vectors whose span is the null space of A. And if you've forgotten what span means, you can go back to lecture eight and refresh your memory on that. So let's try this out. We have this three by five matrix A, and we wanna to try to find a spanning set for the null space of A. And our plan is going to be to solve the equation AX equals zero and write the solution in parametric vector form. And if you've forgotten how to do that, we first learned about parametric vector form for solutions back in lecture 10. We're going to row reduce the coefficient matrix for this equation, and we get this reduced echelon form. Remember that the augmented matrix for this equation would have an extra column of zeros. So when we solve each of these equations for the basic variables, we get these expressions here. That means that x3 and x5 are free variables. So when we go to write this in parametric vector form, we can replace each variable with the expression, or for the free variables, we just say that those variables equal themselves. So we get this solution vector, x1 is negative 5x3 plus 7x5, x2 is negative x3 minus 8x5, x3 is free, so x3 just equals x3, x4 equals negative 4x5, and x5 is free, so x5 just equals x5. As we learned back in lecture 10, we now split this apart and factor out the free variables, and so we get a parametric vector solution that contains two vectors. Let's call those vectors u and v. So the solution set of ax equals zero is the span of u and v, and that shows us that u and v form a spanning set for the null space of A. And so in this case, we solved our equation ax equals zero, we wrote the solution in parametric vector form, and the vectors in that parametric vector form formed a spanning set for the null space of A. And that's the solution process that we're gonna use in general. So when we wanna find a spanning set for the null space, that's exactly what we do. We solve ax equals zero, we write the solution in parametric vector form, and then those vectors will be the vectors that span the null space of A. There will be one vector in that spanning set for each free variable in the equation ax equals zero. But keep in mind the linearly independent columns theorem. A is going to have a pivot in every column if and only if the null space of A equals the set containing the zero vector. In other words, if you don't have any free variables, then the null space of A is just the set containing the zero vector. All right, finally, let's take a look at a couple of abstract examples. So let's suppose that we have a three by four matrix whose third column is all zeros, and we wanna find a non-zero vector in the null space of A. Now, what we would normally do is row reduce A and write the solution of AX equals zero in parametric vector form. Of course, we can't do that here because we don't know very much about this matrix A. All we know is that its third column is all zeros. But what is it that we're looking for? We're looking for a non-zero vector in the null space of A, so we're looking for a vector with the property that A times U equals zero. So let's write down what we do know about A. We don't know much, but we do know that its third column is all zeros, and we're looking for a vector that we can multiply this matrix by that will result in the zero vector. So let's remember that a matrix times a vector is a linear combination of the columns of the matrix. So if we put a non-zero entry in the third entry of U, that third entry of u is gonna get multiplied by the third column of a, which will just result in the zero vector. So it's safe to put a non-zero entry in the third entry of u. And if we put zeros everywhere else, then it doesn't matter what entries are in the first, second, and fourth columns of a. We're gonna get zero times the first column of a, plus zero times the second column of a, plus one times the third column of a, which is all zeros, plus zero times the fourth column of a, that will result in the zero vector. And so we've done it. We found a non-zero vector in the null space of A. All right, let's do one more of these abstract examples. Let's suppose that we have a two by five matrix whose second column equals three times its fourth column. And again, we wanna find a non-zero vector in the null space of A. Well, let's name the columns of A. Let's call them A1 through A5. And what we're given is that A2 is equal to three times A4. 
and we're looking for a non-zero vector in the null space of A. So we're looking for a non-trivial linear combination of the columns of A that equals the zero vector. So if we rewrite the equation a2 equals 3a4 as a2 minus 3a4 equals the zero vector, and fill in the missing columns of a, we get something that looks like this. 0a1 plus 1a2 plus 0a3 plus negative 3a4 plus 0a5 equals the zero vector. But the left-hand side there is just a linear combination of the columns of a, which is the same as a times a vector. Specifically, a times the vector 0, 1, 0, negative 3, 0. And since a times that non-zero vector is equal to the zero vector, that means that that vector is in the null space of A, and that's the solution to our problem. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.